Run. Welcome everybody to On The Run. Yes, uh, we're back. It's been four weeks since the last On The Run. It's been a very, very busy November for IAG and for me personally. So we haven't done the On The Runs. Uh, although I haven't been on the run all through November, I was in uh, Macau until since the last On The Run that I did, which was published on November the morning of November the 4th. And that was four weeks ago. This one will be published on the morning of Friday, December the 1st. It is late on November the 30th as I shoot this. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's been four weeks and I was in Macau all that time until um, Monday. And Monday I went to Hong Kong. And then Tuesday morning this week I flew to, uh, well, you know where I am? Most of you should be able to recognize the color of this room. Yes, I'm in Akata, Manila, the lovely Akata, Manila. And I arrived here on Tuesday. I'm now shooting this Thursday evening. So it's been a long time. So there's a lot of news to get through. So, and, and I've got some opinion on some interesting stories that have come up recently as well. So it's not just recapping the news, it's also thoughts on what's happened here at Akata Manila, and also thoughts on the whole uh, Miriam Adelson thing, and the Dallas Mavericks, and some other thoughts on 2024 and so forth. So let's get into it. So what's been happening since the last on the run? Well, of course, we had the Power 50 uh, on that evening of Friday, November the 4th. I think I've got that date right. Yes, of course I have. Um, and uh, that was a great evening and many of you were there, of the more senior of you were there. And it was just a fantastic night at MGM Macau. Thank you to MGM Macau. Thank you to all the sponsors. I'm not gonna go through all the sponsors, but if you want to uh, see who all the sponsors were and you want to see more information about it, iagpower50.com, uh, the event has its own website. Please go check it out there. And we still have not yet released all the official photos and video from that. We will be doing that uh, in the coming days. Uh, so that will be uh, interesting and that will be fun. We have over a thousand official pictures, I think. And we have the official sort of five minute video and the official 10 minute video. That's gonna be fantastic. Then of course we had the Macau Gaming Show, MGS Entertainment Show uh, in the middle of November. And that was uh, kind of put together quickly and IAG was responsible for producing the summit for the show. We weren't given much notice on that, but we put together, I think, what, a, what was quite a nice summit. We had a really good operators panel uh, with, um, well, well, I try and remember the six people from each operator, one, one from each operator, uh, Craig Fuller Love from Wynn, uh, it was Hubert Wong from MGM. It was uh, Dr. Wilfred Wong from Sands. It was Buddy Lamb from, well, Dr. Buddy Lamb, I should say, from, uh, Galaxy. Melco was Raymond Lowe, of course, again, Dr. Raymond Lowe uh, from Melco. And now who have I missed? SJM was Frank McFadden, of course. And who have I missed? I have uh, MGM win uh, Melco. No, I haven't missed anyone, that's all. So it was a great, uh, it was a great operators panel. And it wasn't just the operators panel, it was the whole day. We only had a one day uh, summit. On November 14, the MGS event was a two-day expo. November 14 and 15 was put together quite um, quite uh, rushed because uh, we didn't know whether we were going to have it in person or, or online until not long before the show. But of course, in 2024, it will definitely be in person. There will be a whole year to prepare. So it will be a much better show. Uh, and then uh, we've been preparing for our final two Mads of the year. So uh, tonight, your time, Friday night, we'll be having Mad Manila at COD at the patio on Nobu. So thank you so much to Melco. Thanks to Jeff Andres and Lawrence Ho and the whole Melco crew and the City of Dreams Manila for their uh, generosity and their hospitality and hosting us tonight, uh, Friday night. And then, of course, we will be having the final um, IAG event for the year, uh, MAD in Macau on December 15, Friday, December 15. Both of the, those events are our respective Christmas parties. We have them on a Friday in December. We normally have them on a Tuesday or Wednesday uh, for the other three quarters of the year. But for the uh, December quarter, 
we we have it on a Friday and make a bit of a party out of it. And of course, the one in Macau on December 15 will be at Artisan Grand Lapa Macau. Thank you so much to uh, Rutger Vershuren and all of the team there at Grand Lapa uh, Macau, Artisan Grand Lapa Macau for uh, your support. And we, we have that traditionally at that uh, venue each Christmas, and it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful uh, a wonderful evening. So let's get into some commentary on what's happened over the last month and how I'm going to do this. I'm going to work up a top 10 from number 10 to number one, but rather than number 10 to number one stories, I'm going to do number 10 to number one topics and talk about multiple stories on each of those topics briefly. So let's start with supplier news as number 10. So there's a couple of interesting stories in the month. Um, Light and Wonder inching closer to their EBITDA target. Their adjusted earnings um, for Q3, they had a great Q3, are 286 million US dollars. So if we multiply that by four to see what their run rate is, that's 1.2 less 414s. 414s, last time I checked, was 56. So 1.15 billion. So they've been working their way up from... uh, what was it? Several, I was sort of like, was it six, seven, eight hundred? No, I think it was six, six hundred million. And um, Matt Wilson, the CEO of Light and Wonder, has come out uh, in, I think it was March or May 22, uh, 2022, and said, look, we want to get our EBITDA up to 1.4 billion by 25. So they're ramping that up and they're doing a great job. And actually, we've done a big interview with Matt Wilson, which we'll be releasing in the new year. Super interesting. Uh, what Light and Wonder are doing. So congratulations to Light and Wonder. Um, another, and an, in, an interesting, in an interesting um, on the move uh, for the supplier industry, Betty Zhao. Many of you would know Betty Zhao, the former COO of uh, LT Game. Betty has moved across to Aruze Gaming Global, who have bought the slots business uh, of Interblock. So that's, uh, whereas the... Um, Sorry, the slots. Yeah, the slots business of Aruze, I should say, and Interblock has bought the ETG business of Aruze. So Aruze has been split up, and uh, um, Interblock. Uh, Jim Preston from Interblock spoke at the Macau Gaming Show and um, in the supplier panel, uh, which was quite interesting, and talked about that. So good luck to Betty. She's moved across from LT Game after being in LT Game for oh gee, I don't know, 12, 14? 15, 16 years, certainly more than 10 and less than 20. I don't know the exact number, but a long, long time and moved over to Aruze Global. And her role, I believe, is um, international, everything outside of the US, Aruze Global, of course, being based in the US. So moving on to number nine now, Vietnam news. So one interesting story this month out of Vietnam, and this was the the Quang Yin authorities about Van Dong. So um, the, the Van Dong property, which has been talked about over and over and over again over the years, uh, and there's a group behind that, a uh, US $2.1 billion integrated resort. And kind of ironically, it's one of two integrated resorts that has received permission from the Vietnamese government to have locals gaming uh, under a, a, a range of rules. Uh, the other one, of course, being uh, Phuc Quoc down at um, Phuc Quoc Island. But it's not open yet. So effectively, the trial is only one casino for Quoc. And that one you've got to fly to. But look, this Van Dong uh, proposal has been around for a long time. And it's uh, one step closer to reality. They say it's going to open in 2032. Still a very, very long time away. But it's interesting. We'll we Eventually, we'll have another big integrated resort in Vietnam. So what have we got at the moment? We've got sort of Ho Tram down south. That's prop- That property's had a lot of problems over the years, of course, that we've documented. Uh, essentially a real estate play these days, I think. Um, then we've got, um, of course, Hoyana with the Sun City handing that over to the Cheng family, uh, uh, Chao Tai Fook. So they've got the Hoyana one. And now we'll have Van Dong as, a, as, as big sort of multi-billion dollar integrated resorts. So that's uh, interesting news out of Vietnam. An interesting story out of Saipan. They're back up, up to number eight now, Saipan, the former Imperial Pacific and Heng Sheng Group a Junket Executive, of course, Mr. G. We all know Mr. G, uh, whose mum officially is the owner. Um, he was deemed head of a criminal syndicate by a mainland China court. So he's uh, in a lot of bother, um, probably not too dissimilar to uh, the Junket operators have had their legal woes out of mainland China. Well, well, actually out of Macau, 
but if they had gone to mainland China, they would have had legal woes there. Uh, but look, it looks like Mr. G, uh, G Xiao Bao, G, G Xiao Bo, I should say, uh, who actually was a power 50 fringe dweller there for a few years. I think he was low in the, I think he was in the 40s or in the ones to watch for there when uh, Imperial Pacific and Saipan was sort of a big thing, but now it's all a big, bit of a mess, isn't it? So uh, yeah, that's news out of Saipan. Uh, number, let's work this out, 10, 9, 8, 7. Number 7, Japan. So um, Dynam Japan sees their revenue and profit increase in the first half uh, on recovery of their pachinko business. So basically, I mean, I won't go into numbers, but basically the news is that Japan pachinko is back, get coming back. So, you know, gaming's back. The point of including this one is that gaming's back all over Asia. So it's not just Macau and the Philippines and Singapore and Malaysia. It's all over Asia. It's Vietnam, it's Japan, it's Korea, it's even Australia. So um, I don't know why I say even Australia, I guess because of all the regulatory woes they have. Australia is funny because the regulatory side is a mess, but the actual playing side, there's a lot of demand. But the problem is that demand's being crunched down by all these new rules. But let's not get into Australia, except for the fact that number six is Australia. And uh, the story there, Crown Sydney to reduce casino opening hours due to ongoing economic and financial pressures. Oh no, like that's kind of sad that they're not 24 seven. Who would have thought that a big major integrated resort uh, a Crown integrated resort, you know, the leading, traditionally the, 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 the leading integrated resort company in Australia opens a multi-billion dollar or a one point whatever billion or whatever it is, or there's two billion, 1.9 billion, I can't remember, or 2.2 Australian, I think, whatever it was. It's a beautiful big property and two gaming floors down to one gaming floor down to not even 24 seven. Who would have thought that they wouldn't be 24 seven? Takes me back to my youngster days back in the 80s in Tasmania, last three hands at uh, 1.45 when they closed at two or they closed at three or depending on what day of the week it was. It's kind of sad. So, and I don't blame Crown. This is not a criticism of Crown in any way, shape or form. It's a criticism of what's going on in a regulatory uh, perspective or from a regulatory angle in Australia. They're really crushing the casinos in Australia. And we've written some commentary on that and we think it's gone too far. And we think that it will create underground gambling and illegal gambling because they won't be subject to all those restrictions. Anyway, let's move on. So number five is, we're going to call this Genting News because it's Singapore, it's Malaysia, and it's the US. So Genting Singapore uh, revenues way up. So congratulations to Tanhi Tech. Congratulations to Andrew McDonald. Congratulations to everybody at Genting Singapore. They're doing very well. Uh, Singapore generally is recovering, but well done to Genting as well. It's not just because of Singapore's general recovery. They're doing uh, a good job. Uh, revenue up 33%, I believe, to 507 uh, million in the third quarter uh, for Sentosa. And they, the big news is they announced this big investment uh, they've increased their expansion. Obviously, both properties in Singapore, Marina Bay Sands and Genting, uh, or Singapore, uh, or Resorts World Genting, uh, Resorts World Sentosa, I should say, um, are both doing major renovations, major expansions as part of the the uh, the, the new regime with the government, with the government uh, putting the entry fee up from 100 to 150 sing. Uh, and giving them extra rooms and making them expand and spend more money. But they've decided to, to up their expansion to 5 billion US. So that's a, an enormous expansion. So congratulations to Sentosa. That shows confidence and it shows that they're confident to invest that kind of money. So well done to Genting. That's really interesting. And it's interesting to see what will play out there in Sentosa. Will they um, you know, put it to Marina Bay Sands? And, and just generally, will they... Uh, you know, become a more profitable uh, entity. On to Genting, um, Malaysia, their net profit grew as well, um, up to 34 million for Q3. Uh, Resorts World Genting resurgence there. And also in Genting news, um, the US even, Resorts World Las Vegas, which I visited uh, last month. Yes, last month is October for me still. For you, it's two months ago now. Uh, yeah, Resorts World Las Vegas, they booked uh, a, revenue, a record revenue and an EBITDA in the third quarter of some 50 something million US starting to get up there. I know that their EBITDA 
was so low that by the time you took off depreciation and amortization, they would be in the red. But they're moving up and slowly but surely ramping up. There have been some issues around that property. Obviously, their leader, Scott Sibilla, um, or Sibella, however you say it, um, was given the hee-ho or, or maybe resigned, whatever, um, but he's no longer there. And there have been some issues around the numbers and some commentary from some of the uh, analysts that they hadn't done so well, but looks like they're getting a little bit better. Now, I think we're up to number four now. Uh, and Middle East, yes, we start to record to report on the Middle East now. This is super interesting. Of course, the Middle East is part of Asia, Inside Asian Gaming. Um, so this month we had reports that there's been so much f fake news out of the Middle East. It's been incredible. I've been sent so many links to, to rubbish stories. But, it, it, but there were credible reports that the UAE may grant one casino license to each of the seven emirates. So the UAE is the United Arab Emirates. Emirates. There are seven emirates, each ruled by an emir, which is like a king. And uh, yeah, uh, each of those can make their own decision. This is what the report says. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But the report says that they're all going to be offered a casino. So that is interesting. So we know that there's going to be win at, uh, at Rak, at uh, Ras al Khaima. Uh, but will there be one at, in Dubai? And of course, the other piece of news was that Beijing's uh, China State Construction Engineering Company got the contract to develop the $1.2 billion MGM-linked resort in Dubai. And of course, Bill Hornbuckle has come out and said, um, actually had a chat with Bill Hornbuckle last month, uh, came out and said that he is super interested in uh, Dubai and the Middle East. So that's a real area of interest for them. So that will be interesting to see. What happens? All right, number three, Philippines. Wow, getting up into the big stuff now. A lot this month in the Philippines. So basically, all good news. Um, some people have been saying the Philippines was a bit flat in the third quarter, but I think that's normal that it's a bit flat in the third quarter because the fourth quarter is always huge for the Philippines. I'm in the Philippines right now. It is busy, busy, busy here. So let's go through some of the news. So Bloomberry had a great uh, result in uh, Q3. Their numbers came out 34 million uh, net profit, bottom line net profit. Uh, so that is fantastic. Well done to to uh, Mr. Razon and uh, to uh, Mr. Arasi who run that property. Uh, that continues to be, I think, you have to say it's the number one. It's clearly the number one in the Philippines. This place where I am now, Ocado Manila is probably number two and trying to chase them down. And that's good, healthy competition. But I think Soler, you, you've still got to give them the 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 front runner uh tag um the uh newport world resorts also had a a great result and their um hotel business actually did very well and uh 25 revenue growth in q3 that was great and akata manila um well they, they they had good news but a little bit different kind of good news um there was a slots outage let's call it a slots outage for now there was speculation that it was a cyber attack and it's been widely reported and widely said it's a cyber attack. But I think probably the thing to comment on that is if it were, was a cyber attack, first of all, that's happening to everyone. We've seen Caesars, we've seen MGM, we've seen um, Marina Bay Sands had some stuff happen. Where it was also, there was another one as well, it just escapes me for the moment, who was, oh, Aristocrat. Um, and there's been a few others I know about that haven't been widely reported. So obviously there is a big cyber group at the moment, cyber terrorists or whatever you want to call them, black hat hackers or whatever, um, doing their ransomware thing, trying to make money out of the world's casinos. So you can't blame uh, casinos for integrated resorts for being attacked. I'm sure all the CIOs in the industry right now are scrambling like crazy to protect their digital assets and to protect their properties and protect the data. I'm sure that's going on. Well, obviously that's going on. But I think the good news for Ocada was how quickly they recovered. I mean, all, all their slot machines were turned off. And I think they did that themselves, I guess, because that seems to be the MO, you know, when something goes wrong in this in this realm, turn everything off. This is what CIOs have told me. The, the, the first reaction is turn everything off and then start to turn things back on one by one and, and, and see the effect. 
But they got their slots back up and running very, very quickly. Um, they were back to 80% within a few days and they were back to 100% beyond that. And I, I've been here, as I say, since Tuesday. I walked around, I didn't get a chance on Tuesday to have a look, but I walked around yesterday on Wednesday and all the slots were on, I guarantee you that. And there were there's one or two little IT issues around the property, all non-gaming stuff, all relatively minor and all things that they have worked around. So you know, um, good luck to them and they've done a good job. So that's that's interesting. But the other great news for Ricardo Manella was of course the Supreme Court finally lifting that status quo ante order they, they put on, which kind of gave uh, Kazuo Okada a uh, license to take over. The courts now come and said that he was properly removed from the company. So this appears to be the actual end of the saga now. This appears to be the end of it. It appears to be that uh, Kazuo Okada has now got nothing to do with the property of Okada Manila. Uh, the Okada now refers to the, the wife or the son or other family members. And uh, this is the end of it. So it looks like uh, the, the uh, Jun Fujimoto and the Universal guys and, of course, uh, President Byron Yip. And that team uh, are the team that have won, for want of a better word, this battle. And they fought off... Uh, well, I sort of fought off Jason Hader as well. That was another... Well, that's actually the next story I'm going to talk about. And they fought off Kazuo Okada. So I don't think they're... If it really is a cyber attack, I don't think they're too worried about that. They seem to have recovered. They've fought off worse things. Um, and the next story is, of course, 26 Capital. So um, the, the sort of financial backer behind 26 Capital is seeking to remove Jason Hader as the principal. Apparently, we did a story on that as well. So it looks like the, the 26 capital Jason Ada merger thing is just done and dusted off the cards, not going to happen. So Akata Manila, you know, it's really interesting, Akata Manila. They've had quite a, you know, they opened in 2019. They had a lot of problems when they opened. Then they had the pandemic hit them. Then they had this 26 capital thing. They had the Akata thing. It's like they've had drama after drama after drama and they fought them off one by one. And actually, they are doing pretty well. They are, you know, they're a big property. They're bigger than Solaire in terms of area and size and offering and machines. Um, Solaire's been the number one for a long time. So, that you know, Solaire's got a very big head start on them. But Ocada Manila have been doing, you know, quite well. And they fought all that stuff off. And now... 2024 could be their year because they've got uh, clear air, no dramas, apart from this little uh, cyber thing, but I think that's pretty much over. So I think once January 1 rolls around, 2024 could be the year of Ocada Manila because they've got actually an empty runway in front of them where they can take the plane off and away they go. No COVID, no pandemic, no cyber, no 26 Capital, no Kazuo Okada, none of these dramas. And they've got some runs on the board with some good profitability too. So good luck to Okada Manila uh, in 2024. Now, Macau. Okay, the number two, Macau. Uh, let's go through it. So lots of great results from Macau. Um, well, first of all, I should, of course, say that congratulations to Francis Loy, the uh, Vice Chairman of Galaxy Entertainment Group for once again being number one uh, in the Power 50. Oh my God, is it five in a row or four in a row? I think it's five in a row. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I should know that. Apologies. Uh, but whatever it is, congratulations to him. He's been number one now for quite a few years. I think it's five uh, because I know uh, Mr. Adelson was six and he hasn't uh, caught up to that yet. I think it was 19, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Yeah, that's five. Pretty sure it's five. Uh, so congratulations to him. That's a really good effort, well-deserved. Although there are people uh, sort of, uh, you know, yapping at his ankles. There are people that are coming up. Uh, Lawrence was named number two. There was some consternation. I, I may as well bring it up. There was some consternation over Pansy Ho being number five. Some people think she should have been higher because um, MGM had done very, very well this year. And they have. They genuinely have done very, very well. Congratulations to MGM. It's really, really great results, which we'll talk about. But the judges felt a few reasons. Uh, there's obviously MGM Resorts International is in there with Pansy Ho, whereas Lawrence has got Melco in his own. He's also got Manila. He's also got Cyprus, although Cyprus is having its problems at the moment with the war over in uh, in uh, with Hamas and, and, uh, and uh, Israel because a lot of players were coming from there. But uh, there's 
Yeah, there are reasons. There are reasons why. Uh, and if you look at the raw numbers, Melco clearly is the number three still in Macau, uh, even though MGM has improved fantastically. And MGM got all those extra tables, 198 tables. So fair play to Pansy Ho. She did really well and, and could feel a little bit hard done by coming in at number five. Uh, but the four above her, pretty hard to find one to put below her, to be honest, based upon the actual numbers. Uh, KT Lim doing well as well. So it was hard. Um, it's just tough at the top to get up into the top three. It's really hard. Uh, anyway, so that was, uh, that was that. Let's go through a few things. So we had MGS, of course, um, in the month just gone by in Macau. We had Kevin Kelly, the COO, the Macau COO of Galaxy. Great guy. Um, gave a really nice keynote speech at MGS. So thank you to Mr. Kelly for doing that. He's been at the helm there uh, working uh, with Francis and getting Galaxy, the great results that Galaxy has got uh, for quite some time. Um, arguably also in the Power 50, arguably could have been higher, but we won't go into the, all those details right now. Um, what else? Uh, MGM, great results. Uh, let's go through them. So Galaxy had a great result, 1.12 billion US in Q3 gaming revenue. Uh, MGS, they got that. Their headline was the EBITDA record. Uh, their Q3 revenues grew uh, 10% on pre COVID, so they're up to 110% of uh, pre COVID uh, in group wide revenue. Melco almost back to break even now in Q3. Their revenues moved over a billion. Even MGM, MGM, even SJM, the clearly the number six of the six, uh, fell to only a 53 million US loss um, with Grand Lisboa continuing to recover. Uh, but gee, Grand Lisboa Palace is a big problem for them. We'll talk about that another day. Uh, what else? We had the Grand Prix in Macau, 145,000 attendees, big record uh, because it was over two weekends. Another interesting thing from Macau this month, Macau Jockey Club, gee, aren't they in a mess? They tried to reduce the prize money to reduce their operating expenses because they've been making loss after loss after loss, year after year after year. But the trainers and the jockeys wouldn't have a bar of it. They threatened to go on strike and they had to backpedal on that and do a flip. And on the other great news is that Melco's bringing back the House of Dancing Water. Yay, that's great. They said it'll be back in late 24. Uh, Franco Dragon is sadly no longer with us. So they're going to have obviously a new person in charge of, of rebuilding it. I'm sure it'll come back bigger and better and different. And that's great because the House of Dancing Water is truly, truly an, a world-class international show. Uh, I've been to many, many Cirque du Soleil, show, uh, Cirque du Soleil shows uh, in the US and elsewhere in the world. And House of Dancing Water is every bit as good as any Cirque du Soleil show. So, um, Cirque du Soleil, not Cirque du Soleil. Soleil is the casino in um, in Manila. Soleil is the French word for sun, of course. Uh, yes, so there you go. That's Macau. And number one, US news. Now, of course, we're inside Asian gaming. We don't normally cover the US, but when it's a US company with Asian uh, linkages, it can be quite interesting to cover and to talk about. And there has been a really interesting thing just in the last few days. So we reported uh, yesterday, for me, that's Wednesday, that uh, Dr. Miriam Adelson, of course, the, uh, the widow of uh, Sheldon Adelson, who inherited his equity in uh, Las Vegas Sands, which of course is the operator of um, of uh, Marina Bay Sands and is the uh, parent company of Sands China Limited, which of course operates Sands in Macau, which operates the five properties, Sands, Macau, Venetian, Parisian, Plaza, and the Londoner. Uh, she is gonna sell off about 10% of her 56% holding in LVS for about 2 billion US dollars. So her, ten, so the other, 90% is probably worth 18 billion, roughly. And that's 56%. So if 56% is worth 20 billion, then it's worth nearly 40 billion, isn't it? Wow, 30, 30 market cap must be 37, 38 billion, something like that. Anyway, so she's going to sell that off to uh, buy a major sporting franchise. Well, it took two seconds for it to come out, which 
major sporting franchise it was is the Dallas Mavericks. Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban's famous for the turnaround of the Dallas Mavericks, actually. And obviously being on Shark Tank as well, Mark Cuban in the US. So at first I thought, what is this? Is Miriam Adelson a basketball fan? I think there must be more to it than this. I thought maybe her son is is uh, is involved in some way, and it turns out he does own a basketball team somewhere. But no, actually, there's a little bit more behind it. Mark Cuban is interested in the gaming industry and interested in an integrated resort in Texas. So that would be interesting because uh, gambling is uh, casino gambling is not legal in Texas, and there's been a push for it over the years, but it hasn't come through. And most of the I mean, Texas is a, is a very red state rurally, but a very blue state urbanly. So the urban centers of Texas, like Dallas, like Austin, you know, very, the very cities of Texas are quite blue leaning and quite liberal or progressive. But there's so much uh, rural area to Texas, of course, that it, as a state, it leans red and Christian red and uh, Christian right red and they don't like gambling. So interesting. So again, so what's behind all this? Well, let's wait and see. Now it did cause share prices to go down, of course. She's offering the, her shares for $44 a share. The market closed before, this was announced um, when the market was closed. It was $48, uh, $47.90 something, nearly $48, I think. So, so sort of 8% below market she offered them at. So obviously then the shares tumbled to 44. But here's the other interesting news. Um, LVS itself is going to buy, they've announced that they're going to buy an eighth of that. They're going to buy 250 million. And they've come out publicly and said that they they, they think the right thing for them to do right now is to buy back their own shares uh, because they're well priced and they're doing very well. And actually, I did have a meeting with Rob Goldstein in last month in uh, uh, in Las Vegas, and he won't mind me saying this because he said it publicly that he he he's got a program for uh, for LVS to buy back their own shares, which makes a lot of sense and will provide more value for the shareholders because, of course, it reduces the denominator in the the fraction, the numerator, and the denominator in terms of shares. There's less shares on issue, so the shares that are on issue become worth more. Any finance guy will tell you that. So really interesting. So. Gee, isn't it an interesting industry that we're all in? What could happen? So could it be that then there's some hookup between Mark Cuban and Miriam Adelson? Miriam Adelson becomes a little bit more public in being a casino mogul with her chairman, Rob Goldstein. And then there's some, do they build a stadium for the Dallas Mavericks? Do they do a whole bunch of good works uh, in Texas or in Dallas, and then, but the deal is that they build an integrated resort, and somehow it's themed something to do with the Mavs and Mark Cuban's involved. Who knows? Who knows? It's so interesting. So I'd love to know what's um, what's going on, and of course, um, all will be revealed as time comes out. So what an interesting month in the gaming industry. Thank you for sticking this far through to the end of the video. It's been a long one because uh, it was a whole month since I'd, or four weeks since I'd um, uh, got back to you. Look, just a few couple of final things. Thoughts on 2024. Uh, I think it's going to be a booming year for the Asian gaming industry. I think we've had our bust. I mean, there's always boom and bust cycles, right? We've had our bust. We've had our COVID. COVID's now it's gone. We got 23 out of the way. 23 was a recovery and a realignment year. Certainly was for us at IAG. I know it was for a lot of the properties. We didn't know that um, COVID zero was going to be gone until January 8. So we couldn't plan in Q4 of 22 for 23, but we can plan in Q4 of 23 for 24. So I think 24 is going to be a booming year. We've got the relicensing out of the way for Macau. Clark is booming. The rest of the Philippines is, is, is steady. Uh, Singapore is up. Malaysia is up. Australia is coming. Australia will be coming out of the, all this regulatory stuff. I just think 24 is going to be a great year and 25 is going to be a phenomenal year. It will be a continuation of 24 and it will build upon what's happening in 24. So I'm very bullish now uh, about the industry compared to where I was at 
two years ago, which was quite um, bearish for the Macau industry. I'm bullish for everywhere, including Macau. So here comes Macau, look out, and no junkets to worry about. And I think China's gonna leave Macau alone because they did this year. So I think they're gonna do that for another year at least before they take another look. And I think all the operators are gonna behave and do, and, and there's not gonna be capital flight and they're gonna play within the rules. And I think that's gonna be good for them in the long run. So I think we've got a really, really good 24 uh, coming, uh, coming up. And final, uh, final run for me, um, I'm in Manila now. I'll be here most of next week. Uh, and then back to Macau. I'll be in Macau as long as I need to be in Macau to have a few meetings. I'm waiting on some people to give me some dates. So that'll get me through into deep into December, uh, then to Hong Kong for a night or two, and then to Melbourne for Christmas as I traditionally do. And I might even have a little bit of a rest down there and take some time off because it's been a hell of a 2023. I'm kind of exhausted. So we normally take January off. There'll be no events for IAG until March. So we usually have a bit of a break in January, February. And, you know, of course, we'll be reporting on the news, but it's a little bit of a quieter time for us. And um, I think the whole team deserves it and needs it. So that's it. A very long on the run this, uh, this, this week, uh, or this time, I should say. Uh, if you're coming to uh, the, the MAD event at Nobu uh, Patio at City of Dreams Manila tonight, I really look forward to seeing you. If you're coming to the one on December 15 in Macau at Artisan Grand Lapa Macau, I look forward to seeing you there. Have a great weekend. And that's it for now. And see you next time. Run.